Hi. In this lecture, we're going to discuss application of the Fermi energy expression that we derived in the last one. So, to remind you, the Fermi energy is the highest occupied energy state in a system of fermions at absolute zero. It's also a really good approximation to the highest occupied energy state at reasonable temperatures, like room temperature and such. The express expression that we derived in the last lecture was E Fermi is equal to H squared over 8N times 3n over pi v to the 2 thirds power. Now, most of the things in this expression are constant. h is Planck's constant, 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds. n is just the mass of the fermion in question. So, for example, for a system of conduction electrons, it would be the mass of an electron. The only real unknown here is this n over v, which is the number of fermions that you have in your system per unit volume, okay? So in our calculation for n over v, that's uh, or in our calculation for the Fermi energy, this n over v is really the main thing that we have to, you know, figure out, and the rest of it is plug and chug. So let's do an example problem for how one would find the Fermi energy in a metal for the conduction electron. So here's the one I decided to pick on. Let's pick on silver. Okay. Silver has one conduction electron per atom. So basically the idea in metallic bonding is that you have these ionic cores and each one of these metal atoms donates an electron to the free electron gas or the free electron C or the Dirac C. This is the model for metallic bonding, okay? And then these electrons, they roam around the lattice as a whole and act as a glue holding these positively charged ionic cores together. This makes metallic bonding non-directional and has a lot of implications for why metals behave the way they do. I have other lectures on that one, okay? So basically, since um, you need to know the total number of electrons donated by each metal atom in order to figure out this N over V value. So silver donates one electron per atom to this free electron C. Now we know the density of silver, okay? It's 1.05 times 10 to the fourth kilograms per cubic meter. You can look this up in tables. Now, from reading off the periodic table, we know that the molar mass of silver is 107.87 grams per mole. And we can use these facts, the density of silver, the number of conduction electrons per atom, and the molar mass to find the Fermi energy. And we're also going to find the Fermi speed, and I'll talk about what that is in just a second. So, Little n here I'm taking to mean um, n over v. That's the density of conduction electrons in silver. So we're going to do a unit conversion from a mass per unit volume to a number of electrons per unit volume. So that's done as shown. Here you have the stated density of silver, 1.05 times 10 to the fourth kilograms per cubic meter. And then we've got the molar mass in terms of grams per mole. So let's go ahead and convert from kilograms to grams. Um, to do that, you multiply by 1,000 grams per kilogram. And then we can convert from grams to moles using the molar mass. To do that, we divide by the uh, molar mass, 107.87 grams per mole. And then we convert from moles to atoms, right? So one mole is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms. Now, because silver contributes one electron per atom, that makes the density of conduction electrons in silver 5.86 times 10 to the 28 electrons per cubic meter. That's our n over v. Now, we're going to plug this in to our formula for the Fermi energy. We have h squared over, um, that's a typo, 8n, 3n over pi v, sorry for the typo. We're going to plug that in now, n over v, into our expression. So remember, h is 6.626 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds, and the mass of an electron is 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. And then we plug in 5.86 times 10 to the 28 electrons per cubic meter for n over v. Plugging all that into our calculator, we end up with a Fermi energy of 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 19 joules. Now, 1.602 times 10 to the minus 19 joules in one electron volt means that our Fermi energy for silver is 5.5 eV. Okay, so we found the Fermi energy for silver, a useful thing to know. Now the question also says, find the Fermi speed of silver. Okay, so what's a Fermi speed? Well, if you set the Fermi energy equal to the kinetic energy for a single conduction electron, 
then you have E Fermi is equal to 1 half MV Fermi squared. V Fermi is the Fermi speed, okay? So if the Fermi energy is the kinetic energy that the highest energy conduction electrons have, then the Fermi speed would be the fastest estimated speed that these conduction electrons are going. So plugging into this formula, we can solve for V Fermi. V Fermi would be the square root of two times the Fermi energy divided by mass. And that gives us two square root of two times 8.8 .8 times 10 to the minus 19 joules over 9.11 times 10 to the minus 31 kilograms. Finding that value, it's 1.4 times 10 to the sixth meters per second. So first of all, we said it was non-relativistic, right? And this is, um, you know, less than 1% of the speed of light. So the non-relativistic approximation actually works pretty well here, as you can see. But some of the implications for that are, you know, it gives us kind of the ballpark speed for our conduction electrons in a metal. And look, even at absolute zero, these electrons are really zipping, okay? So what happens is the electrons are moving around really quickly, but they have a lot of collisions, right, with the lattice defects and with each other, okay? And so that's why, you know, the drift speed, for example, in a, in a conductor, if you apply a voltage, the speed that the electrons drift or roll along can be relatively slow, um, even though their Fermi speeds, how fast they're going is, is really fast because they have a lot of collisions, okay, and scatter a lot, okay? But this kind of runs counter to some of our assumptions, I guess, about what it means to be cold. Remember that for um, our, our um, Maxwell-Boltzmann ideal gas, we envision these gas molecules is zipping around and then as they get colder and colder they get more and more sluggish right and they move slower and slower and then we defined absolute zero as the point where all molecular motion ceased now that is a decent model for an ideal gas and in fact it's um, you know pretty true they do slow way down as they get cold and then of course eventually they liquefy and they're not gases anymore but still okay um, it's not a bad model but remember that it's not the same model as what's going on with these fermions. These are not classical particles. They don't obey the same physics. And so you can't assume that their motion is going to stop at absolute zero. In fact, it doesn't. It zips around. They're going really fast. Okay. So just because something's cold doesn't always mean that it stops if you're talking about a different system, a different kind of particle. Okay, now we can also find the total internal energy at absolute zero. So the Fermi energy is just the energy that the highest occupied electrons have. To find the total internal energy, that would be the energy of the entire system of conduction electrons. So what we can do there to find that value um, at absolute zero is integrate over all possible energies, okay? So that means that this little sphere that we talked about, this little one-eighth sphere that we talked about when we derived the Fermi energy in a previous lecture, we're going to do it again, okay? And this time, we're going to plug in um, to our integration the value of our energy, and we're going to integrate it over all possible values of n. So we're going to use spherical coordinates. Um, since uh, our quantum number is kind of our radial vector here, remember that our little differential volume element from spherical coordinates uh, if you're talking about a radius, would be r squared sine theta dr d theta dc. But since we're uh, doing uh, quantum number space here, instead of r squared, we've got n squared sine of theta um, d, d n d theta dc. Okay, so that's what we're going to integrate. And so we integrate our little differential volume element times our energy to find our total energy. Um, and this energy is the energy per particle. Okay, so here we go. Um, for each set of quantum numbers, we're going to have two quantum states, or two particles, one spin up, one spin down. So that's our two out front. And then we're going to integrate over dn, d theta, and dc for these values. So plugging in there, I have the integral from 0 to n max, okay, uh, of n squared times our energy, h squared n squared over 8 ml squared, and then that'll be our dn. And then we also have the integral over our angular coordinates, sine theta, d theta, and then dc. Now the limit okay, um, are for both of those angular values, 0 to pi over 2, because remember, we're not integrating over the entire sphere. We're integrating over only positive values of n, which restricts our angles from 0 to pi over 2 for both theta and phi.
Okay, so this is what we're integrating. So now let's just do this integral. Uh, 2h squared over 8ml squared, that's all constants. I can pull it out front of my integral. And then I'm integrating from 0 to n max of n to the fourth dn, 0 to pi over 2 of sine of theta d theta, and 0 to pi over 2 of dt. Okay? Now, when you integrate into the fourth, you get into the fifth over 5. Evaluating that from 0 to n max, I have n max to the fifth over 5. If I'm integrating d phi, then I get phi. Evaluating that from 0 to pi over 2, I get pi over 2. So that gives me this pi over 2. Now, integrating sine of theta, I get minus cosine of theta. And then the limits of my integration are 0 to pi over 2. So that would be uh, minus cosine of pi over 2 uh, minus a minus cosine of 0, which gives me 1. So that means that my total internal energy U will be all of this stuff, h squared over 4ml squared, um, times uh, n max to the fifth over 5 times pi over 2 times 1. And multiplying all those things together and simplifying, I end up with pi h squared n max to the fifth over 40 ml squared. Okay? Now, we started off way back talking about how the number of conduction electrons would be equal to pi n max cubed over 3. So that means that I can solve now for n and 3n would be equal to pi n max cubed. So I can plug in to my expression here, pi n max cubed of this u value would be due to n, 3n. Now the Fermi energy I said in a previous lecture was h squared n max squared over 8 ml squared. That was covered in the last lecture, okay? So that means the Fermi energy over five is h squared n max squared over 40 ml squared, okay? Okay, great. So if I multiply 3n times e Fermi over 5, I get that expression for u. So that means that u is 3 fifths times n times e Fermi, okay? Now I realize that this might be a bit confusing if you haven't watched the previous lecture. These things build on one another, okay? I'm just trying to keep the lecture times down. So make sure that you've watched that previous lecture before you talk, um, before you look at this one. Now that we've developed an expression for our total internal energy, u. We can use it to find all kinds of great things, right? So one of the things that we can find is the degeneracy pressure. And this is a really cool thing, okay? The degeneracy pressure is what keeps matter from collapsing under the huge electrostatic forces that try to pull electrons and protons together. That's a quote um, from Schroeder, um, our textbook for this thermal physics class. And degeneracy pressure is really due to the Pauli exclusion principle. So it just keeps those fermions from collapsing into already filled states. So what is this value? Well, if you look at your um, thermodynamic identity, du is equal to TDS minus PDV plus mu dn, and you hold the um, entropy and the number of particles constant, in other words, you set the ds and the dn equal to zero then you end up with um, du is equal to minus PEV. So this gives you a nice partial derivative expression. P is equal to the minus partial of u with respect to V, holding SN in constant. So if you take that expression that we had on the previous slide for u, u is 3 fifths times N times the Fermi energy. And then you plug in for what the Fermi energy is, h squared over 8N times 3N over pi V to the 2 thirds power, right? then I can take that partial with respect to V. So that's what I'm doing here. Minus partial with respect to V of 3 fifths N E Fermi, which is 3 fifths N H squared over 8 M, 3 N over pi to the 2 thirds. And then look here, I broke out the V because I'm only taking the partial with respect to V. It's the only important part. So all these constants are times V to the minus 2 thirds power. Okay. All right. So um, this gives me um, minus two-thirds times v to the minus five-thirds when I take that partial derivative of just that v term. And then the constants, they stay there. They're still in that expression, okay? So when I finish with all of that and I simplify it in the algebra, then what I end up with is that the pressure, the degeneracy pressure, is equal to two-fifths times n over v times e Fermi. Or, if you wanted to rearrange things, 2u over 3v, okay? So this is our expression for the degeneracy pressure. Now we're gonna come back to this idea when we discuss white dwarfs and neutron stars. So that's really fun, something to look forward to. 
But degeneracy pressures are really, really super high pressures. And it's way too high to measure in a typical lab setting, for example. So the bulk modulus, though, that we can measure in a typical lab setting. And the bulk modulus is the change in pressure when the material is compressed, divided by the fractional change in volume. Our definition of how to find a bulk modulus, given uh, an expression, is B is equal to minus B times the partial of P with respect to V holding T constant. Now, for our um, system, this is equal to 10 ninths times U over V. And this expression is generally applicable uh, within a factor of three. So it works within a factor of three or so for most um, materials. So if you wanted to know how to derive that expression, like where did that 10 ninths U over V thing come from that's just handed down in Schroeder for you, here's the derivation for it, okay? So uh, I'm not gonna go through it in excruciating detail. There's a lot of partials. If you want to stare at it for a second, make sure that you believe me. Pause the video, and here you go, okay? So pause the video if you want to know more about this derivation, but this is where it comes from. Okay, um, I'm going to stop there in this lecture. In the next lecture, I'll go into an example applying um, some of these concepts to the idea of white dwarf stars. So I'll see you then.